Do you, good morning. Do you want to yeah. play this one? Yes. Have you been practicing that? No. I just got They were too expensive. You could play, just play one verse of something and I will, and then I'll start. This is Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church on this Palm Sunday. Are there any announcements? I have one. We have one. <laughs> we have a new face here. And uh, I've seen all of these. We have a dear guest at the piano. Edie uh, has, uh, Wickham has uh, uh, said yes to a uh, uh, somewhat of a uh, regular monthly appearance here. So we are absolutely delighted. My first little qualifier before I forget, because I can forget things, huh, Carl? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, I've thrown all this at Edie, and then uh, I made a change at the end. Uh, and so uh, any hiccups, you, you can throw the tomatoes at me because it is not her fault at all. This is uh, my last minute tendency to change things up a little bit. And that's because uh, in your worship bulletin, where we have for the last six years been singing the Agnes Day and Sanctus uh, before the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing This is the Feast, which is in your songbook at the beginning of your songbook. And I want to make just a couple notations there for you if you want to look at it just to uh, help me out so I don't have tomatoes thrown at me. Uh, and so right at the beginning of your songbook, there is, uh, I think it's the last page, yeah, it's the page before the first hymn. This is the feast. And it's a wonderful hymn. The verses, it all comes out of the text of Revelation, uh, chapter 3 or 4. And that's what these words are. They're just the verses of Revelation. And we start with, and you'll notice, first of all, there's a refrain at the top of the page and a refrain at the bottom of the page. Uh, the refrain at the top of the page is the one we sing on verses 1, 2, and 4. And then the final refrain on the bottom is what we sing at 5, because it has kind of a crescendo, uh, glorious ending. There's no refrain between stanzas three and four. Uh, we go from stanza three right into stanza four. So you can see where I have totally confused uh, the situation. But it is so beautiful, and I would like to learn this and keep it. Uh, so that's just an FYI. And Edie, thank you for saying yes. I said that to one other person in my life about 30 some years ago, uh, so thank you for coming aboard, so, all right. Thank you. Other, okay, another announcement? Um, if you have not signed the Memorial Easter Lily list, um, it will be in the hospitality room to sign for Easter Lily for next Sunday. Okay, with that. One more. I forgot about these pretty little green things are palm for Palm Sunday, which is today. Uh, it's the last Sunday in Lent, and we want to keep these. 
And if you see them up in the office, don't throw them away. I'll try to put them in a baggie, because this is what we burn and use for Ash Wednesday. So uh, just leave them on the, you don't need to put them anywhere, just leave them. But if you want to take one home, that's fine, we have plenty. Uh, but the ones that are left over, I'm going to put in the baggie, put in the office, so you diligent office uh, helpers and servants, uh, please uh, don't throw them away when you see them up there. All right. Okay. Please stand if you are able for our opening hymn, number five in your songbook. Join with me in the spirit of opening prayer. Lord, we are gathered together to call upon your name. We are pilgrims and we are strangers in a world whose values, Lord, are not the values of your kingdom. And so we come here, Lord, to seek and we seek refreshment. And ultimately, Lord, we really seek your smile. We seek the acceptance, the welcoming of your hands and the embrace of your arms. And of course this is by your spirit, Lord, in which the new covenant has been blessed with because you have now dispensed your spirit into the lives of your followers. As you did with Moses and the elders on select occasions, other people as well, throughout the Old Covenant, you now, Lord, by mark of the New Covenant, 
You grant us the participation and indeed the indwelling of your very presence in the tabernacles of our own bodies. And so, Lord, this has been a shockwave. This has been a tsunami in the world, turning it upside down. And we at our point and juncture in history, Lord, have our calling to do exactly what the church is called to do, which is let that light shine in this world and land of darkness and selfishness and egoism that has run amok. Lord, I pray that you will let us see your son and that you will... Help us in our feeble efforts, Lord, to render our reasonable service to you, which is our worship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The confession and declaration, our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. We have died. Christ has risen. We have risen. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the residue of sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Please take a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. His Declaration of Grace Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Our call to praise is from Psalm 31. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my ears with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror on every single side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. 
My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Please see the screen for the psalm hymn response. Whoever does not know the scriptures does not know the power of God nor his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. Whoever wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. Amen to that psalm. I'm going to see if I can read these little teeny tiny words. <laughs> so today's uh, Old Testament scripture is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 1 through 9. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniqui iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem, or I have no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a desert, 
Their fish sink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turn not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. The second reading today is from Philippians chapter 2, 4 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. The Gospel reading comes to us from Luke's Gospel, and during this time of year, they're quite lengthy. So sit back and enjoy, use your God-given imagination, and follow the story with your ears and heart. The word of the Lord. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Then Pilate heard this. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he had, that he, when he had learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him, then arraigned him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. 
for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, You brought me this man as one who has who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release us Barabbas! A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What, what evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have that never before that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Then there were also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly? For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. 
The word of the Lord. And now, as you're able, let's stand and sing together number four in your songbook, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. quickened by the Spirit, even as a Presbyterian, you may stand up and Lord, I pray that you will be in our speaking and in our hearing and in our heart's meditation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as I look at these uh, texts that are presented to us in the call to praise, Psalm 31, uh, Isaiah 50, Philippians 2, and of course Luke's gospel narrative form, giving us the crucifixion of Jesus. I think we can extract a theme or two and work with it and focusing on a couple items. The Psalm 31 is a request for God to be gracious. And then there's this thing called, which... I actually gleaned from John Kerry when he was Secretary of State. Mr. Flip-Flopper, I think, is what Trump would probably have called him because the media called him that. He flip-flopped on a couple issues. Uh, but on the issue of Taiwan, he had a lecture, and I was listening to it. And I was intrigued by his notion because right now Taiwan's in the spotlight because Ukraine... Uh, if Russia succeeds in Ukraine, where there was this urging of the expansion of NATO, but no one was sure what the West would do, since they're not a part of NATO. 
Likewise, Taiwan. Kerry said that our U.S. policy with Taiwan is best described as purposeful ambiguity. Purposeful ambiguity. And as I look at the Bible from cover to cover, and I look at those very clear verses uh, when Jesus comes and he's queried as to why he speaks in parables. You know what his answers were. I, I do so because those who are listening, I don't want them to hear. At least some. And those who have ears that have been opened by God and are thus good trees will hear be glad and follow me. So there must be some purposeful ambiguity in the text of Scripture. And indeed, you know, if you've been sitting here for any length of time, that's indeed what I think is happening regarding Jesus and the Old Covenant. When I was a new believer, I was so excited. Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, how could any thinking person, uh, uh, how could any thinking Jew conclude otherwise? I mean, Isaiah 53, right? Uh, uh, he is uh, born our sicknesses. He, uh, uh, God has uh, been pleased to bruise him for our sakes, and by his stripes we are healed. I mean, who could that be other than Jesus? And uh, I think that's correct from the eyes of faith, but now having been educated and been put through the apparatus of learning language and all of these things, there's purposeful ambiguity in the text of Scripture. And I think for the same reason that Jesus said regarding why he used parables. And we see that here. When Jesus was rock, walking down the road to Emmaus and two disciples were walking with him and they were speaking of the tragedy of Jesus' death, but they could not see him until they ate the bread and drank from the drink. And then their eyes were opened. Now that indicates to me that there must be a work of the Spirit for our eyes to see and for our ears to hear. Otherwise, we hear, yet we don't. We see, yet we don't. That just seems to be pervasive in the text of Scripture. Now, when he was walking down the road, he said, Do you not know that these things which testify of me must come to pass? All the prophets and all of the whole Old Testament speaks of me. Now when Jesus said that, what he means by that is that he's in this text. Somewhere he's in the text. Now not with every word, not with every phrase, we mustn't get silly here, but there's a pervasive witness in the Old Testament regarding Jesus. Now I think he's hidden in a lot of different ways. We could talk about the ways in which he's hidden. Now this is kind of a messianic psalm here, Psalm 31 in the call to praise. And we must find Jesus here because Jesus told us that we not only have permission to do so, he actually said all the prophets and all the word, the Moses, speak of me. And so here I think there's some purposeful ambiguity, which I might want to use a phrase like this, um, a <coughs> deficient foreshadowing, a deficient foreshadowing. I think Christ is in here, but it's deficient, not from God's vantage point. This is exactly what is intended to be in the text, but it's deficient in that I think these are the words that Jesus is praying uh, and that come from his life. Be gracious to me. I'm in distress in verse 
uh, 9 there. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, my bones waste away. See, now that's the deficient foreshadowing. Jesus did not have personal iniquity. Jesus did not have his bones waste away because of his sin. So that's why this is a deficient foreshadowing. This psalm is messianic. It points to Christ, but it's deficient. Because in the historical situation, another person who lived before Christ, uh, before Jesus, and this is his experience. And he's a man of faith, but he's under great duress. But he's under duress because of his sin. So the deficient foreshadowing, if this actually is a messianic psalm, and if it's foreshadowing the coming of the Messiah, it's deficient on this level. It's not for Jesus' personal sin in which he is stricken with grief and his bones are spent. It's your sin, it's my sin, that Christ is experiencing this distress. His eyes are wasting from grief, and his soul and his body also suffer from this deep grief. There's the deficiency in the foreshadowing of Christ being in this psalm. Now, he goes on. Here's this kind of purposeful ambiguity now taking up with verse 11. Because of my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. Now, in the psalm here, let me just turn to it so I don't say something that's not accurate here. This is Psalm 31. Yes, it's much larger than the verses that we have here. And uh, in there, he exclaims that uh, 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 I will not be put to shame. Indeed, let the wicked be put to shame because I trust in you. Verse 19 of Psalm 31, which you don't have. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. Okay, so, so there's this kind of, I'm in a state of distress and reproach, and yet I'm not. So which is it? Are you in a state of reproach or are you not? And so this is that both and. And when we confess together, don't we? This applies to all of us. And it applies to Jesus and his life as a human God. As, not a human God, but a God-man. Okay? We say, do we not? We desire yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet. You see, Christ the God-man experienced reproach. He experienced his eyes and his bones filled with grief as he looked to the ultimate calling that he had, which was the call to die and to be crucified. And in this life of his, it's clearly he was reproached. We read from Luke. They mocked him. They pulled his beard out. They spit on him. Isaiah said he was beaten beyond recognition. If that isn't reproach, I don't know what is. When your closest followers, you know, we watch the presidential first hundred days, and the press is always eager, who's resigning? You see, who's, who's walking away from the cause of the elect president of our time? Because it's reproachful. If you can't get your closest cabinet on board with you, you must be off somewhere. Everyone Jesus had walked away. 
And even the women who are put in a better light than the men, they looked from a distance because they were confounded at the death of the one they believed was the Christ, the anointed one, the one who was to come. Oh, if there was any reproach, Jesus experienced reproach. But you see, faith has a journey. Faith has chapters like a book does. And a good book develops tension, purposeful ambiguity. And you can't simply guess the end of a good novel or a good suspense story. And this was a crashing blow to all who claimed to follow Jesus. Even one of his leading disciples denied that he was even his disciple. That's reproach, brothers and sisters. Aren't you from Torrington, that church where that Pastor Nate Johnson, I don't know him. I don't go there. I go to the, the other one. Yeah, that's reproach. You're misinterpreted, you're misconstrued, you're prejudged. Jesus had it. Purposeful ambiguity. And the purposeful ambiguity in this sense, now as we look at Christ as an example, and we're to follow him, is we're to trust in him regardless of our circumstances. Regardless of the reproach. You see, being a Christian doesn't mean that all things go well. And I know the American dream. My children will have it better than I. We've been so blessed as a country, we can actually labor in toil and sweat to make that true. Not all succeed. Not all don't succeed because it's their fault. But for the most part, you can work diligently and have your children have a better future and a better predicament than you had. But that's not the Christian walk of faith. We're promised reproach. We're promised accusation. We're promised false accusation, persecution, and we're promised that we must choose our allegiance. Now, this person of faith in Psalm and Christ preeminently in verse 15, my times are in your hand. I mean, that's the thing that has to color your world. That wonderful, wonderful love song by Chicago. I don't know. Maybe not. Some of these 60s people. Who is it? Color my world. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. We need to color our world with this truth that God is sovereign, that he's in control, that our times are are in his hand. That enables you to stand up under reproach, under attack. If you think attack is not coming because you're a Christian and all goes well because the king of kings on my side, then you've misunderstood the storyline and the whole suspense of this life of two kingdoms that coexist until he returns. You're promised not a better life than Peter, Paul, and Mary, you're promised, oh, sometimes it's just terrible to crack a joke. Uh, yeah, you're promised reproach and persecution, and a, you're under the call to be faithful. Okay, that's the introduction to uh, the call to praise. There is purposeful ambiguity. The man who wrote Psalm 31 was real. He had a historical time, and this is his description. And it's deficiently foreshadowing Christ, and it's deficient because Christ doesn't repent and confess his sin. What does he do? He bears our sin. That's the deficiency when there's a foreshadowing of Christ, which is frequent. Take David, take Abraham, take Moses, take any of them. They all are deficient as a type of Christ because they're filled with personal sin. Okay, now, uh, Isaiah 50 that Lee had read to you, let's just take a look at that uh, and see what we can glean here. 
There is a great debate about verse 1, chapter 50 of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? And which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Now, how do we take these questions? Do they presuppose that there is a certificate of divorce? That God has sent Israel away through that certificate? Or even worse, the creditors? That adds another ambiguous element in the story here. God has no creditors, okay? <laughs> he's in debt to no one because he's God. But has God given Israel a certificate of divorce? Is this a rhetorical question that says, I haven't given you a certificate of divorce. Why are you not being faithful? Which then fits with verse 2. Why when I came was there no man? Where are your faithful ones? You are my people and I have called you to a life of faith and purity, holiness. And I'm here, but you aren't here. Isaiah chapter 2, my people are dumber than an ass. At least an ass knows its owner. But my people Israel don't even know who I am. We're seeing that today, aren't we, in the external church. There are some who are egregiously violating God's standards. All right. Now, that's the question. Is a certificate of divorce presumed? And therefore, he's asking them, why when I came was there no man? Because you're unfaithful. That's why. But I haven't given you a certificate of divorce, and for certainly I haven't sold you to my creditors, because I, the Lord God, the living one, don't have any creditors by which I would it would necessitate for me to sell you. In Deuteronomy, you can look it up, uh, there's actually a procedure by which you can sell your family into servitude to pay off a debt. So that's kind of what's being played on here. But God has no debt. Now the other take is that God has given them a certificate of divorce. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce? You see, these people are complaining. And on the certificate of divorce that was in Israel, the man, is the only one who could file for a formal divorce, had to give a reason for the divorce certificate. She burnt my toast. Yeah. There was a debate within Israel as to what constituted divorce. There's were, there were the conservatives, narrow permission, and then there was the liberal, anything goes. You didn't even have to come up with a reason, like in our day and age. Hmm. What is it called? No-fault divorce. I'm just out of here. That was the liberal wing. The conservative wing, you had to have a reason. But the reasons were varied. And on a continuum, you could leave your wife because you found somebody that looked a little better than she. It was terrible. Sin had so infested God's people. They didn't understand what marriage was. So they didn't understand who God was and his commitment to marriage. But you can violate you can so disgrace God, you can so walk in sin and rebellion that a certificate of divorce comes. And so based on that reading, that a certificate of divorce was given, then the question in verse 2 comes in a different manner. Why, when I came, was there no man? That's a rhetorical question. You ran off and you committed adultery with me. And yes, I gave you a writ of divorce. And it's on there. If you get it out, you will see it. And now I've come. Where are your lovers? 
You are crying to me. You are complaining because of the overpowering of an evil nation upon you. And I've come to see your saviors whom you committed adultery with. Where are they? Implied not to be found because there's no God who can comfort and protect. There's only one. And that's the God of Israel, the true and living God. So there's the debate there. You can study it, look at commentaries, uh, decide for yourself. Now, isn't a divorce final? Doesn't a divorce indicate that the covenant has been so violated that it's broken? Yes, Protestants affirm that. Catholics don't. They come up with reasons why the divorce uh, really wasn't a marriage at all, even after a handful of children. If you have money like the Kennedys, you can get an annulment. Forty years and many children, but it never was a marriage. Protestants, we're bold. Bye-bye. See you later. I'm off to see someone else. It's called in sociology serial monogamy. Now, but even with the Protestant view that you can have a biblical divorce when certain things happen, the view is this, you don't have to divorce. And so in verse 2b, it says, is my hand shortened that I cannot redeem you? Or have I no power to deliver? And then look what he says right after that. To see, behold, by my rebuke I dried up the sea. I make the rivers a desert. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. That's the deliverance that God gave Israel at the beginning from Egypt when they were in bondage as slaves. That whole creditor thing that we read earlier, right? And so here it is. Yes, I gave you a writ of divorce, but you don't think I can redeem you? You don't think I can take you back and make this a marriage even after you've violated it? Don't you know that my chesed, my covenant faithfulness and compassion is more powerful than your rebellion? I don't have to divorce you. And even after I divorce you, I can reconcile, I can take you back and make you the bride that I have ordained from eternity to have. See, now you can chew on that. Purposeful ambiguity. Isaiah is composed of many chapters on the servant. The servant is sometimes specifically referred to as a collective singular. It's Israel. Israel's the servant of God. Sometimes the servant is referred to an individual because it's referred to an individual within Israel. Who's the servant? Purposeful ambiguity, P-A. Purposeful ambiguity. And here's where you can see, if you have eyes, the true servant finally shows up. Israel, the collective singular, so egregiously violated the covenant of God that he divorced her. We need a new servant. We need a servant that's faithful. And so we find that now here, in, ushered in to Isaiah here. Verse 4, the Lord God has given me the ton of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. See, Jesus was the God-man. There's a heresy in the early church that denied his humanity. Jesus grew in wisdom. He was God, fully God, yet he was fully man. And we really don't, I don't think anybody has understood all the details on the minutia. But for sure, Jesus increased his learning. From his humanity's side, he increased his learning. And he was a true man who was called to have faithful obedience. And so he learned through his suffering, through his reproach, to strengthen his faith and to grasp his hold on God the Father. And that's what's meant here in verse 4. 
The Lord has given me the ton of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. What did Jesus say? Come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden in the King James Version and I will give you rest. The divorce was biblical from God's vantage point and Israel's the guilty party. But there's rest for Israel. There's no sin too deep. There's no darkness too dark that God doesn't redeem, that he doesn't deliver. It's all under the blood of Christ. Nothing you have done. Not Ted Bundy, not Jeffrey Dormer, and I keep on using those two because those who think they're kind of okay say, well, if there is a hell, it's, it's Hitler, Bundy, and Dormer. It's all of us before the holy presence of God that I might sustain with a word him or who, her, who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens me. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. There's the faithful servant. The collective singular Israel has failed. All her kings, all her prophets, all her priests, they're stained with sin. They partook of the sacrificial system that God designed to give them hope as a foreshadowing of Christ. But here's the servant of servants, and God the Father awakens his ear so that he hears as a good faithful servant does. Verse 5, the Lord has opened my ear. That explains why his ear was awakened, why he's able to hear as someone being taught, because God opened his ear. Verse 5, and I was not in rebellion. I was not rebellious. But you see, Israel, who got a certificate of divorce, was rebellious. He, she committed adultery before God, spiritual adultery. Some shining examples, even literal adultery. Now comes the messianic part, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike me, my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face. That's reproach. That's attack. That's persecution. And before Pilate, he said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' response says, you said so. But he did not respond. He did not defend himself because he had a divine purpose of redemption which is needed to deliver the unfaithful humanity whom he has come to save. That's you and that's me and indeed that's the entire world. I gave my back for them, my cheeks, my face. Verse 7, but the Lord helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. You see, there's that purposeful ambiguity. You know, Jesus stood in all likelihood absolutely nude because in mockery they stripped him. He was there with everything exposed. And yet, purposeful ambiguity. I gave my back, my cheeks, I did not hide my face. And in Luke, they stripped him and gave a false, what do you call auction? And yet he still concludes, the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. You see, Joseph wasn't disgraced. Why? Because they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. The cross was meant for evil, a mockery, a reproach, but God meant it for good. And so God can say, uh, I, uh, uh, the Lord helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. There's no disgrace here. There's no reproach here. That's what they meant it for, though. But there's none. There's salvation, your salvation, my salvation. There's absolutely no reproach here. There is persecution. And there is a human shame, 
exposing one's entire body within the Jewish mindset was reprehensible. The cross itself, no Jew, not a guilty Jew, hung from the cross, but Jesus did. And now he begins to build on why he is not disgraced. Ultimately, verse 8, he who vindicates me is near. You see, that's where faith reaches through the clouds. It reaches through the darkness. And faith gives one assurance that God is meaning this experience for my ultimate good. And no one can take that from me. Therefore, verse 7c, uh, I set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. There's that denial of shame. I will not be shamed in this experience. Not ultimately. God's doing a work here. Verse 8, he who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? There's another rhetorical question. And the answer is presupposed. No one will contend with me. The one who vindicates me is near me. No one can reproach me. No one can contend with my guilt. I have none. And I stand with utter confidence because there's no one that can attack me and accuse me. More rhetorical flourishing. The end of verse 8. Who is my adversary, therefore? Answer, there is none. In case you're not following... There's even an invitation. Let him come near to me. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Now, there is none. There's no accusation. Pilate confessed it. The soldiers at the end confessed it. Herod confessed it. The Jews knew it. Verse 9, behold, Has, hasn't been used here yet, so that's a, that's a wake-up call. You know, it's like a shout from the pulpit, behold, God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Paul says, as we've been learning in Wednesday's study, know you not that those of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. You've died already. You've suffered death already. But in the righteous one, in the true servant, who death could not hold. And so next week we're going to be talking about what happened as he bore the indictment and the guilty verdict of you and me, himself having none, but he bore it. But because we're now in Christ, we can say with him, holding on to his leg like a little toddler does his mother and father, who's here to accuse me of taking that chocolate chip cookie? Absolutely, entirely, silence. You have been declared innocent in the Son. We weren't able to get to Philippians 2 in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe we can weave that in somewhere. Amen. Now stand as you're able and let's confess the Nicene Creed together. This is the historic Christian faith put into words of beauty because they are words of truth. The Nicene Creed. Found in the front of your songbook. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And, all things visible and, invisible. and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ.
made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one Please be seated. And now we'll open up for a time of prayer. If you are so inclined to pray, then uh, please do so. We would love to enter into your prayer, your calling upon the Lord. If you Pray silently, know that God hears your prayer, and with a word, he sustains us who are weary. Weary in body, weary in soul, weary with sin, sickness, we're weary. And so, let us call upon the Lord. I will begin the prayer, and, and then when there's silence, I'll ask you to join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. So let us come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, you are our help in times of trouble. You are our praise in times of blessing. And you are always the God who is to be worshipped in all situations. And Lord, these things are possible because you have given us your spirit. We can connect with you. We can receive help from you because in faith we are following your call on our lives one of which is to call upon you. And that's what we do here, Lord. We call upon you. Please drench this worship service and our prayers in your mercy and give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And now hear the prayers of your people. Please be with Bonnie and Lynn and their family as Bonnie survives another time in the hospital. Lord God, I pray that you will be preparing many people in this county for the Goshen County National Day of Prayer coming up on May 5th. I pray that you will stir your people to stand publicly and to pray for so many things that mark our world with the touch of evil and sin. And I thank you that you have provided us a country where we are yet able to stand publicly and pray to give glory to the one and only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> and I just pray that you will open eyes and ears and minds and especially hearts to gather together, to stand together as Christians, and to honor you. Lord, I, I lift up all the covenant children in this body and in your church at large and in general. Lord, uh, so many of them and, and so many people here have experienced their covenant children walking away from the faith to one degree or another. Lord, and I pray that you move in their lives in a way that, that humbles them
them and brings them back to you, uh, back to attendance at the church and with the church body. And just lift them all up to you, Lord. And we, each and every one know who's, who those are in our experience and in our relations. Lord, I pray for this community. There are so many people in need. And I'm not referring necessarily to food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, most people have that or have access to it. Lord, they're just in need of, of a Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so many will look anywhere but where they need to look, which is to Christ as Lord and Savior, and to his church, which is the ambassador of King Jesus here on earth. They just won't look at the church as a way to deal with the problems that they have in their life. Lord, I pray that you move in them uh, to do so. Pray that you do that which only you can do, uh, which is to open eyes to you, who you are, what you mean, uh, ears to your word, which is about you and who you are. And Lord, open up the hearts. Take those hearts of stone and convert them to hearts of flesh so that they can see and believe that you are Lord and Savior. And ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I just continue to pray for Kurt and Darlene that you may ease Darlene's suffering and uh, bring her strength and stamina to take care of her, and I just ask that you bring them both to peace. Lord God, I, I pray that you, again, remind your people, as we heard in the sermon, that there, there will be persecution, and there is persecution, and we are not brought into this world and not brought to true saving faith so that we can have a fun life. We are to suffer with Christ. And I pray that you will strengthen your people for that and help us to remember that this is but the blink of an eye. Even if we suffer greatly until we are called home, the time here is a blink of an eye. And so it's temporary, and we are, are promised more. But do prepare us to stand boldly in the times of persecution. Now, if you would, please join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together, printed in your bulletin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Lift up our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Uh, and now we open up to the new, uh, yes, I almost forgot. Uh, I was about ready to say the, the other one here. Uh, it's in the front of your bulletin, right before the first hymn. And uh, so um, we have uh, the first, ref the, the normal refrain on top, the last refrain for the last verse on the bottom, and we skip a refrain between uh, verses three and four. We just sing those stanzas together without a refrain. Uh, uh, I believe is the, yes, okay. So, we will learn this, but I want us to learn it, not because it's just a cute song, it's a very worshipful song, but because it is scripture, and it's Christ as the foreshadowing reality, which we are going to have a foretaste of here shortly. And so, this is such a, segue, a scriptural segue into the foreshadowing that Christ has given us in the bread and in the fruit of the vine. So, as it's said in someone by someone, take it away, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good intro, but no, we'll just jump right into the right stanzas. Well, yeah, let's, let's, I think we probably, let's, let's sing the, stand, the, the refrain and then go into stanza one. Okay. This is the feast of victory for our God.
made it. I stumbled through many things, but uh, uh, eventually we will do well with it. During the Passover, where a lamb was set aside for an annual sacrifice for the sins of God's people, Christ gathered his disciples because he was ready to be sacrificed as the eternal Lamb of God, the single one-time sacrifice for the sins of the world. And prior to that, he met with them, and he gave them this tradition, whereby he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ given for you. You can just dip it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I should have had a napkin here. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Come. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 land given for you. Now stand as you're able. Let's sing our closing hymn number 66. God sent forth, sent forth by God's blessing. Number 66.
And now for the benediction, since we didn't get to the passage, Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort that flows from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete joy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count the needs of others as significant and serve them as Christ has served us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.